So let's stand for the word this morning. You still love me? Yes. All right. Let's stand for the word. Let's be the church that takes a position. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you're visiting this morning, there's a Bible right in front of you in the vicinity there, tucked underneath in, in one of the little shelves there. You can pick it up. By the way, it's good to have some good friends of ours that, that shoot with us, the Fetzer family. Good to have you guys here today. And so I, I saw some of you talking to them and welcoming them in. They're, they're fellow man and shooters of mine. And so um, uh, welcome, Fetzers. This morning in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is telling us in verse 14, let's pick up there. He says, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill and cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but I came to fulfill. You know, if you ever wondered what Jesus said he was coming to fulfill there, he came to, to fulfill the Mosaic requirement of the payment of sin. That's what he came to fulfill. He came to fulfill what the prophets would say would happen, that, that there would come a Messiah. He didn't come to destroy them. He came to fulfill what they were saying was a requirement. And so at Christmas time, um, we are to let our light shine that Jesus came to, to fulfill the wages of sin, which would be death. And he took the price on the cross of Calvary. We celebrate that at Easter. But at Christmas time, we celebrate, celebrate the fact that Jesus is, is, our, is the, the king that came from heaven to die on the cross for us. Amen? So let's celebrate his birth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, this time together. Thank you for this message, Lord, uh, of encouragement to, for us to, to gather as a church and, and take this light, this wonderful light of Jesus Christ, out to the world, especially at Christmas time. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. You know, I, I, the next two Sundays uh, will be Sundays dedicated to, to more of a Christmas message. But today, I felt it necessary to, as, as our church, to wrap my arms around us as, as individuals and, and as, a, as a body and, and give us some direction. I think it's very important for us to to take the, the light of, the, of Jesus Christ out into our communities, wherever we're from. You know, we come as a church here, as a regional church, we come from all different places in the front range. And it's amazing to see what God, what God does can do through us if we, in a coordinated effort, gather our hearts together and, and go forward out into the community. With some, you know, 100 people in this room, 100 people on, on, uh, on Saturday nights, and 100 people in first service, you know, that's some 300 adults that, that could be taking the light of Jesus Christ to the community. And never is there a greater time during the year, except at Christmas, is there a greater time for the for people who are away from Jesus Christ. And the, the, the world is hurting in so many areas. Never is there a greater time for us in the, in the, in the year to take Jesus to the world. But what they'll be, they'll not be more receptive of, of our message to them. And so that's very important that we take the message to them in an appropriate way and not be silent, especially at Christmas. I was doing some research on light, and I, I love to use illustrations, so let me give you a visual. Benjamin Franklin, everybody remembers ben Benjamin Franklin, he wanted to interest, interest people in, in uh, the, the city of Philadelphia in street lighting. He felt like the town was too dark. And so he didn't call a town meeting. He didn't call a, a council meeting or a council session. He just merely did what he thought was a good idea, and he took it to the street, so to speak. And what he did was he built a beautiful lantern because he didn't get to go to Walmart and just buy one. And so he built a lantern, and he built a stand. And, and it was kind of upside down L-shaped, and, and it reached out over the city. And he would go out every day, and he would put a new wick in it and oil and he would light the light the wick and and catch it on fire and and it would shed light up on the street down below it was amazing to see how um he took such good care of it and eventually there was one and then two and then three and he lived on a corner block so there was four he he made one one up the street from the corner one at the corner and two down the street and and it was amazing to see that over time 
people started gathering underneath his lanterns. And people started gathering for fellowships. Or he would notice that if someone was walking down the dark side of the, of the street, they would cross over at his street and walk in, into his light because they felt safer, more secure, and they felt like they could find their way if they, if they walked in the light of Benjamin Franklin in front of his home. And so pretty soon there was more lights popping up down the street and around the corners. And pretty soon the entire city of, Fort, of Philadelphia incorporated light, street lights uh, in their city and in their town. And what an amazing example to us, I think, that is a story, is a message that I want to share with you today. That if we as believers, the objective of this message would be that is if we as believers could, could rally together and let our line, light be so, such a shining light to the community. Think how at Christmas time we could invite people and help them change their life. And maybe get some hurt out of their life. Or maybe address the hurt. And it, it, if, if it all else fails, just maybe the, the fact that they would address it and help them with their hurts. There's, this year, this church has helped more people. You, you can talk to Crystal and, and to, to Candace and to Julie and and Sheila and, and everyone in our office, this year we have helped more people, I think, than in the history of this church. And that's, it's amazing to me to help 25 families from the Matthews house and, and to help all these families in 6.8 and then to help numerous families with turkey dinners and with turkeys. It was just has been a, an amazing outpouring of our church. And I, you might just want to say thank you to each other because you really stepped up and to know that there's only one tag left back there. Is, is amazing because to, to, to meet all the needs of, of every single person, and by the way, there have been people that have walked in the door, I'm not even including them, that we've given out hundreds of dollars to help people. One lady in, in our church needed some help with utilities. Another family in our church needed some help with groceries. Another family needed some help with, with, with some car repairs and, and just everything hitting. And you know what? I'd rather be, have it out there than in, sitting in our savings account. Amen? Because it does no good in our savings account. Out in people's hands is where it's going to do good. So keep that light shining. You know, if you need help, ask for help. If, you've, if you can help, keep your light shining and help other people. Amen? And so what we learn here from this scripture is pretty powerful. You know, light, the, the nature of light is important for us to understand. Light comes from, from a, a photon that is created. A photon is emitted and, and it has electrons and protons. And, and when that, th those atoms begin to move as it's e coming from an emitter called a photon emitter, it, it begins to, to, to change. The, the electron slows down and it creates a light for some reason. I, I don't know everything about it. And, and I'm not going to show you how, less, how much little, little I do know about it to, to talk too much about it. But I did find that, that this, this photon em emitter is, is, is emitting th this electricity. And in, like in a light bulb, for instance, th there's a filament there. And because it's in a vacuum with no oxygen in it, there's no combustion. But it gets heated up enough to where it creates, it gets so hot, but yet it doesn't combust that it creates a light. And it creates a very bright light. And if the filament is new, then it's going to tra transfer that, <coughs> that electricity across it. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't know how, but it changes my voice. Now all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a tenor all of a sudden. <clears throat> That's a funny story. I'll tell a story quick. Because <clears throat> I want to preach with power. But um, I remember as a little kid, my grandfather was preaching. <clears throat> and it was in a church. It was a little church. And, and he was my pastor. And there was this one bulb that hang, hung down. Just a light bulb. And it hung down over the, over the pulpit. And it's in the summertime. And this Miller moth is flying around it. And he's like looking at that thing, and I can tell he is, he is like ready to grab the thing. And he gets so fired up, he's like hollering, and he's like getting on it, man. He's preaching the fire. And that crazy Miller went right into his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, flew right in there, and he didn't miss a beat. He goes, <laughs> and then he says, fix that thing, didn't I? <laughs> man, I tell you what. I got my voice back, so I'm good to go now. <laughs> Let me just say this before I 
before I say anything more, that, that filament that is, that is emitting light has a source. You know, a lot of times illustrations in my life make it clearer for me to understand things. We have a source. And that source is Jesus Christ. And he's our source that, that illuminates our filament, so to speak. And we become the light of the world. So the nature of light is that the, the, the nature of light is to remove darkness. That's what it, 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 its objective is, is to remove darkness. Therefore, it's understood that with the absence of light, there is darkness. So if the absence of light is darkness, the presence of light is, is the absence of darkness. And so therefore, we, have, we, we should be people that bring light to the world. If we are the light of the world. Now, how many of you have ever walked into a room and the light switch couldn't be found? It's kind of a, a, a crazy feeling, isn't it? You, you, you're feeling all around for something and you're, you know the light switch is there, but you, for the life of you, you can't find it. You know, light gives perspective. It gives perspective to the human eye. The human eye needs light. It, it shines in and, and it goes into an imaging processor and then that goes to our brain that we begin to see what that light is shining in. If there is no light, it's very difficult to see, isn't it? You will be walking along, and if it's dark, and you know the stairs are there, you, you stop, and, and you feel around for that step, don't you? And, and pretty soon you're like stretched out because you're trying to feel for that light or for that, that floor. You're trying to feel for that stair, and you're reaching for the handrail, and you're reach, trying to find the light. And if, I don't know about you, but it's a crazy thing when, when you know, you, you flip... You flip the lights on and all of a sudden, oh, the stairs are clear over there. And you walk five feet and there it is, you know. I remember as a kid, in high school, in college, I would, I would come home too late. And my father always said, come home early. And that doesn't mean early in the morning. Because we got work to do on the farm tomorrow. And, and so I, I had been violating that many times. And I remember one night I came down the hallway of our farmhouse. And the middle of the floor creaked. So you know where I'm going, right? <laughs> Walk down the middle of the floor. She says, I didn't want to wake up mom and dad. Don't try this, okay? <laughs> Kids, no ideas here. So I'm walking like this down the hallway. And my mother, who is a trickster, had tricked me. She had put a bunch of, in the day, she had put a bunch of milk bottles. <laughs> because she knew my trick. <laughs> So I'm walking down the hall, clank, 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 oh, 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 and I hear this voice, welcome home, Rick. <laughs> she did the same thing to my grandfather one time, and um, we never forgave her for it. <laughs> the nature of light helps the human eye see. It gives us depth of perception, it gives us speed of, of the object coming at us or that we need to be moving towards it. It tells us what the substance is. If we bump into something and we, then we look at it, we're like, oh, I must have misjudged where I was walking, but we can see it and we won't bump into it the next time. But in darkness, we don't see objects coming at us. And if, you know, there is a certain sense about us that when we are about to run into a cabinet or something that in a dark room, you, you kind of just at the last second, you kind of feel the ambience coming off of it? Well, if that light was on, you would see it and you would have avoided it. And that's what light does for us. It helps us judge heat and cool. We can see that if something's glowing, not to touch it. We understand that if it's got frost on it, it's frozen. We understand those things by sight. So light gives us perception. Say that with me. Ready? Light gives us perception. Now, as we walk through this message, I want you to know that light has also a speed to it. Light is fast. Light travels at the rate of 670,616,629 miles per hour. So, let me give you some, some, some relevance to that. With the speed of light, the moon is 1.2 seconds away. So while I just said that, you could have traveled to the moon. And by, the, by me saying this, you could have come back. And now you could have gone up and back again by the speed of light. Isn't that fast? The sun is a little bit different story, but it only takes 16 minutes for a bolt of, of, of light to get to the sun and back. 16 minutes. 
You can travel across this galaxy, ga galaxy or galaxy, as we also call it. You can travel across the galaxy in about 40 days with the speed of light. Isn't that amazing? We have a big galaxy, and light is fast, but it's not that fast. But light is pretty fast, amen? As my son would say, it makes fast look slow. Okay? So light is fast. Light removes darkness. And in the Christian realm, when it, re when it removes darkness, that means to get a load of this, it reveals spiritual danger. That's why the light of Jesus came to the world, is to reveal spiritual danger in our lives. So that we'll know where to place our foot. It will be the light into our path. It will give understanding inside of us. It, it reveals things from the inside out. In John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says that, that Jesus came as the word of God to shine as the light of truth into our hearts. Isn't that amazing that he wants to shine into our lights? He came to bring a light, not a bright light, a blinding light, but a bright light that's appropriate into our lives. And yet, I see that before Jesus said, you are the light of the world, in verse 14, he said in John 8, 12, these very words. He said, and they're up on the board, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, that, that's a clear statement to me that Jesus came and he's, that, he's that, that flashlight that we all need. You know, when I, when I think of, uh, of him as the source, I think of a, a wonderful light that we can shine into the darkness. And we are to be like a mirror. We are to be like a mirror that if he is the flashlight then, and we are to reflect light, we could be a mirror that can flash the light and the love of Jesus into people's lives. It depends on what angle you're at. But you know, if I were to take that mirror and, and give it to Pastor Mark and say, Pastor Mark, take that light or take that mirror and go across the parking lot. It would take a pretty big beam. It would take a very strong light, much greater than just a little flashlight to reach that mirror that Pastor Mark could flash into other people's lives. Really, the only light that would, that would be seen would be the flashlight and not the light from the mirror. Would you agree with that? But if that mirror, if Pastor Mark brought that mirror back close, we could work together. And we could work together to, to flash and reflect that light of a flashlight into other areas to where we could see. Maybe as much as five or six feet away, we could, we could begin to... Before the light, you know, fragmented, we could shine some light. You see, that's why it's important to stay close to Jesus, the source. If you don't stay close to Jesus, you'll be out a part of the darkness. Oh, you'll have the, you'll have the mirror, and you'll have the ability to shed light on things, but you won't have much light. You won't have much light, and so it's important that as the body of Christ this morning that we stay close to Jesus Stay close to our church. Stay close to the word of God so that we can shine some light into other people's lives. So the position of light is very important. Look at verse 15. It says that after he says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Then he says in verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. You know, to me, as, as, we're, as we're being a lamp, why, why would we as a church and society and, and as Christians, why would we be silent about our faith? Why would we not share with someone who is hurting? Why wouldn't we help them a little bit? You know, I, I would encourage you today that as we kind of have this, this rally meeting today to get ready to go into the next two Sundays of services, to be a church that's coordinated. All of us are coordinated and ready to do our part in our community. You know, I, I can just give you an illustration of, of what has worked in the past for me. Is if when I used to work at a, at a, at a nuclear weapons plant, I, I would go to the office and, and there would always, there would be hundreds of people in the office there that worked for me. And, and as, as they were having a, a rough day, it kind of spread to everybody else. You know, you know what I'm talking about? That, that person that just kind of, ugh, it just ruins it for everybody. And, and, but, but me and my jovial dumb self, would walk in and say, hey, how are you doing? How can I help you today? Is there something I can do? It seems like you're a little bit down today. Would there be something that, that I could do for you? And, and you know, there's, if there's one thing that seems to be a neutral area for everybody, it's for us to say, 
can I help you with something? Can I lift you up a little bit? You know, could, could, would there be a time, would you allow me to pray for you? That might be a little intrusive for some people, but it's okay to say, is it okay if I pray for you? And they might, they, they might think you mean on your own, away from here, that it might, you might not want to embarrass them, and that's okay. But at least you've begun to shed that light into someone's life that you are close to, that says you're close to Jesus. It doesn't say we're perfect. It doesn't say we, we never sin. It doesn't say that we just have everything working because how many of us Christians know it doesn't always work, right? It doesn't work for us. But we have that re thing called repentance. We have that thing called, Lord, forgive me. We have that thing called, hey, I love you enough to care about you and reach out to you. Let me tell you, an act of kindness in someone's life over these holidays will give you entrance to invite them to church. It will give you entrance to invite them someplace where they can hear a message. You know, you're not the savior. You're the reflector. Amen? Remember that you're the reflector and you can reflect Jesus Christ. So the position of light is important. We're a city set on a hill. We're a, we're a, a light sitting on a lampstand, not, not put behind the shelf and covered up and only brought out when it's popular. But how about being that light, even when it's not popular, like maybe even the, the topic that, you know, the world is okay with abortion, but should the church be? I don't think we should. I think we should stand against it. And we should help those that have had them and, and let them know because their, their heart is just broken when they figure out what they have done. And we need to be there for them as a church. Amen? Amen. The radiance of light is very important. In verse 16, look what it says. He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I think people want to see a sermon before they hear one. Amen? I, I think you can really speak into people's lives if you'll live it before they hear it. Amen? And, and then they'll say things like, I, I knew you were a Christian. I, I just knew that because of, there's just something about you. That's what they should say about us as Christians. Amen? Amen? They should say that about us because we should be the people that, that are always positive. We should be the ones that are uplifting and encouraging. And when we're not, we should recognize it on the inside and say, Lord, help me. Help me to overcome this because I'm negatively affecting people. Help me to be that positive person with a positive tone in my voice. See, it, this doesn't mean because we have a position to do it that we walk up to people and tell them they're going to hell unless they turn their life over to Jesus. But essentially what we're doing is we're saying, let me help you make wise decisions by introducing you to Jesus, who is the light. And when the word begins to work in their life, oh my goodness, I remember the first time my pastor encouraged me to read Ephesians chapter 1. And I was in Bible school, 33 years old. And, and he was he's like, Rick, if you're going to make it, you're going to have to learn who you are in Christ. You're going to have to figure out this thing that's in, on the inside is greater than that which is on, in the world on the outside. And I would encourage you, Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, 4, 5, and 6. Powerful book that's short and concise and tells you who you are in Christ Jesus. It tells you what, what Christ has done for you on the cross of Calvary. How he found us before we, we even... He founded us before we were even created. And he had it in his heart to love us before the foundations of the world. Isn't that an amazing message? That he would love us before we even knew him or knew that our sin could separate us from God. And so when my pastor told me, he was like, Rick, you're going to have to really get this grounded in your heart of who you are in Christ. I think those of you that have been in this church very long, you would say, that's what pastor teaches every week is who we are in Christ. Who we are. How strong we can be in Christ Jesus. We can overcome anything. Anything of our past in Christ Jesus. If we're strong enough. If we shed enough light on the circumstances. You know in this verse. In the next verse. In verse 16. It says let your light. And I, I love the word there. That, and I, and I kind of work on the words a little bit. But he uses in three times. He uses the word your. The possessive noun of your. It's possessing. That means that we, we own it. And what we do with it is up to us. Number one, he says this. He says, let your light so shine before men. So we are called 
because we own the light that he has given to us. We own what we do. We're responsible. When I say you own it, you're responsible for it. That, so personally possess your light. In other words, you are, are called to let your light shine. To be that person who is willing to say, hey, I love you. Can I help you with something? Can I, can I do something for you? There's, there's many, many ways to possess your light and to share Jesus Christ. Number two, personally take action to share your light. Look what he says. He says that they may see your good works. And lastly, personally take time to glorify the Father in front of the world. In other words, he says glorify your Father in heaven. There's nothing wrong. I mean, I just want to say as your pastor, as a coach in this community, just, I just say to you, it's okay for you to openly proclaim your love of Jesus Christ. It's okay to do that. If, if, if it needed to be said to be okay, then as your pastor, I say, it's okay. Don't be shy just because the schools and everybody's pushing back and saying, you, you know, don't. That doesn't mean that we don't just still go ahead and, and share Jesus Christ to willing hearts and open hearts. Amen? Amen. Don't be ashamed to, or, or afraid to confess the Lord. And, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with inviting someone to church and saying, come worship with us. They, they may not know what worship means, but... I know we live in a, in a generation where every word has to be per, you know, just perfectly selected. But there's nothing wrong with saying, would you join me for worship? Let's go and let's worship and celebrate Christmas. Let's find out about Christmas. I, I think it's okay to just go back to some roots that we all grew up with and just say, would you come to church with me? Would you come and worship with me? And so as you do that, don't be afraid to, to like next week we'll have some touch cards available. We call touch cards, and, and we'll, we'll put them in everybody's hands. If you want one, or some, you can take them and invite your friends. Invite your, your family. Invite people that you know. Maybe even that person that's hard to get along with at work. Go ahead and reach out to them and be that person that says, Hey, come join us for, for worship. We'd love to have you come to River of Life and join us as we worship God. Listen, before I, I close this message, you, you know my heart. It, it's not... It can't be about having a thousand person church that we spread the gospel. It has to be about building strong people. Strong hearts, amen? Strong Christians who can go through difficult times because how many of you know we do, amen? It's because we have Jesus in our life doesn't mean that we never go through difficult times. And so with that said, this is not to build a big church. We're a church of, I don't know, four, 450 people. Saturday night services has grown us by about a hundred people. Isn't that amazing? For the first night we had a hundred people there. God is doing something there on Saturday nights at the AMP. But let me just tell you, church, if we do that and it's just a mediocre message, the Bible talks about lukewarm water. He says, I'll spew it out of my mouth. Amen. Let's be a church that keeps our lamp lit that keeps our light shining brightly. Let's be that church. Let's be a people that says, I'm going to shine my light. There's nothing wrong also with, you know, going all out for God. This week, you know, after, after football season, the, we had a good season. We went to the championship. But after that, the, the principal said, can you coach basketball another year? So I coached basketball another year. And, and you know, football players don't sometimes make good basketball players. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but we have a basketball team that there, there's no quit in them. The, the, they have the right mindset of there's no quit. And they don't quit. We finally, you know, we got through the season and, and it, it wasn't the season that, that we wanted. It wasn't. That's behind us now. We have to play what we have left. And you know, John Wooden once said, the hardest thing to do is to beat the same team twice. And, and I just wanted to give you this illustration as to who I, how I live my life and what, as your pastor... I believe we should do as Christians. 
As we went through the season, it didn't come out the way exactly the way we wanted to, but the boys learned and they grew and they got better at, at the sport. And we had to go and we had to beat a team twice. And we beat them pretty handily on the first night. And then they had to come out to our place because the, the first game was regular season. The second game was for seeding. Who went to the tournament and who stayed home. And as you know, I'm not, I don't really like to lose. I don't practice to lose. I practice to win. Amen. But when you do lose, you find out what happened. So we went to work at practice and we fixed a bunch of stuff. We, at least we think we did. And we played tomorrow. We, we played the next night and we beat him again. So we, we, we beat the same team twice. So the thing that John Wooden said is tough to do. And we did it. And we, we made it into the, into the tournament by the skin of our teeth. And you know, we then have to go and play the very best team in the, in the regular season. So we were the lowest entry seed, and now we got to go play the best. But let me tell you something. We have everybody back, everybody's healthy, and we're playing, hitting on all cylinders. So let me tell you something. Sometimes in life, you just have to go all out. And you know, it applies in, in, our, in, our, in our personal life. What, what I'm coaching the boys to do is, we are going to press them with everything we've got. We're going to play tough. We're going to move hard. We're going we're to get after them. And I know that Christianity isn't a basketball game. But there comes a time in a season like Christmas where, you know, the light of Jesus Christ is, is brightly shining. And we need to run in that light. We need to get out there and, and push the darkness back and let people know when they come in these doors that they are so welcome of all walks of life. Every single background, every single person is welcome to come through those doors and be a part of our services. No matter what they've done in life, no matter where they've been, it's not our job to judge them. It's our job to forgive. Amen? It's our job to love them because the life that we save might be the neighbor that we once talked to a couple weeks ago. It might be that person that we tried to give a touch card to and guess what? Out of the blue they show up and you're like, wow, I didn't think you were coming. And here they are. And they come and they find Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And then they have the responsibility to allow the light shine and to help them make those decisions in the darkness. If they, you give them a light, oh, now I can see which way to go. I can see how to handle to work in my marriage. I can see how to handle my finances. I can see all these things. I, now I know. And it's all because you were able to reach out to them and just love them, invite them to church, invite them to find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Praise God. Let's all stand and let's, let's close with a word of prayer.